Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, as Gilbert mentioned, I'm Nolan Peterson, President and CEO of World Copper Limited. We trade on the TSXV under WCU and on the OTCQB as WCUFF. We've prepared this slide deck today, which I'll go through rather quickly because of limited time. And I do want to take some questions, but please feel free to review it later uh, when you have a moment. So starting with the company, we are based in Vancouver and we have operations or assets in Chile and in Arizona in the United States, which we just picked up through our acquisition recently. Our focus is on Chile at the moment, which we have some exciting news coming down the pipe for, which I'll talk about in a second. Very briefly about myself, my background is engineering. So I've worked in the mining industry for almost 20 years now, starting as an engineer. Along the way, I've worked for a number of development companies in developing assets and putting mines into production, starting from exploration and then into development and construction. I also have a financial background as a CFA and an MBA, and I've spent the last five years in corporate finance, raising money, doing budgets and plans, long-term strategy and accounting. So I bring a broad experience to the company from start to finish of the value creation chain for the mining industry. Oh, sorry, I should have put it on this slide. <laughs> Let's talk about copper. Why is world copper focused on this element? Copper is a significantly important element for the glo world's global economy, and it is facing a supply and demand crunch in the near future. If you see from this chart here, and also some of the comments, analysts and forecasters are predicting a deficit in the supply and demand of copper by the end of the decade. In fact, this deficit is starting in 2025. And even today, very, I mean, literally today, we are seeing the impacts of low supply in the copper market. Uh, copper is becoming harder and harder to find uh, in high grade, high quality deposits like we used to in the past. All the best deposits have been mined out or are in production already, leaving us with the, the, the deposits that are still coming online. Uh, which are not as good, unfortunately. Uh, only four major discoveries in the last 10 years and just one in the last five years. In the last decade, $50 billion was spent on exploration and development and only 225 billion pounds of copper was discovered in that 10 year period. And in fact, in one year in 1991 alone, more copper was discovered. So that should give you an indication of, uh, the, of low supply. What is driving the demand side of copper is its use in electrification and decarbonization of the global economy and limiting uh, the impacts of climate change. So as we are moving towards electric vehicles, as we are moving towards wind and solar power generation, demand is expected to pick up from copper. And this is on top of normal infrastructure building in countries such as China and India or continents like Africa that are westernizing and becoming more and more modern uh, buildings, uh, transportation networks, charging stations, uh, electrifications of their grids. Uh, this is becoming uh, an issue. So you can see again, this confluence as these two facts come together and are creating this gap. We see a robust uh, copper market in the future. Copper is currently trading at about $4.50 per pound. Uh, and analysts are projecting potentially $7 per pound by 2025. That would be a significant increase from where it is even today. So let's talk about our assets. I'll focus in on the Escalonis project in Chile, which is our flagship asset. We are in Chile because Chile is the number one copper mining jurisdiction in the world. 30% of the world's copper is produced in Chile and 30% of the, 30 to 40% of the world's copper reserves and resources are found in Chile as well. We have two fantastic assets there, but I will talk uh, only about Escalonis in this presentation. So Escalonis is our flagship asset. It's in the Santiago region of Chile, so near the capital of Chile. Uh, and there are a number of mines in the region as well. So it's a very uh, strong mining jurisdiction, even though it is near to Santiago. The reason for that, of course, is the infrastructure benefits that it's provided by being to, next to such a large city, but also being far enough away where that is not so much of an issue. To the west of us, 35 kilometers is El Teniente, 
El Teniente is the world's largest underground copper mine held by the world's largest underground copper company, Cadelco. So they, you can tell by having neighbors like that, we are in an attractive jurisdiction. This property was previously held by a previous explorer who had drilled 25,000 meters of uh, drill holes in 53 holes. And that's all within this orange circle here. Immediately to the south of that, we have a target, which we call the Mancha Amaria. Uh, and then to the northeast, we have three other targets, uh, all copper porphyries that have the potential to be as large or larger than the main resource alone. Let me talk briefly about a, a, a technical issue, uh, which uh, you may find interesting, that is very relevant to understanding Escalonis. And then I'll circle back to Escalonis. Copper is produced via two primary methods of production, via sulfide flotation or oxide heap leaching. Sulfides are how copper comes to the Earth's surface over millions of years and over millions of years ago. Over time, a large portion of the top layer of that sulfide deposit gets oxidized by the Earth's groundwater and creates copper oxides. So you end up with two different types of ore, oxides and sulfides. 70% of the world's copper is produced via sulfide flotation, and the other 30% is produced via oxide heat leaching, which is a completely different process. And both of these processes have different economic and permitting uh, um, implications. Sulfide flotation processes are very expensive to put into production. Minimum costs of mil one billion to two billion dollars to start with. In many cases, upwards of four to five billion. The operating costs are higher. The margins are lower, so the profitability and the time to payback is lower as well. Uh, the process uses four times as much water as oxide heat leaching and uses. 60% more greenhouse gases. The product of flotation is a 30% copper concentrate, so not pure copper, that you have to send to smelters, often in Asia, such as China or Korea, where the pollution is hidden in, in those countries, and then you ship that product back to North America or, or Europe, or it's used locally, and at that point you have pure usable copper. Oxide heap leaching, in contrast, is significantly lower in initial capital to develop. We're talking hundreds of millions, not billions. The processing is much simpler and you use electricity to produce 100% pure copper cathode, which attracts a premium, not only for being greener and cleaner to produce, but also because it is so usable. The reason why not all copper is produced through oxide heat leaching is because of the limitations of finding very large fantastic oxide heap leach deposits, as most of them near the surface have already been mined out or too small to be mined. So how does that relate to Escalonis? We picked up this asset as a sulfide resource. What we have done over the last year is focused in on the oxide potential. Again, our cap, we have a cap like every, every other deposit of copper oxide. We focused on that to see how well we could recover that copper instead of the sulfide copper through the other process. We ended up getting a resource of 426 million tons, grading at 0.37% copper. At these tons and grades, this makes this deposit in Chile the largest copper oxide deposit in the country. And if you're the largest anything in Chile related to copper, you must be truly impressive indeed. We do have a benchmark here that shows us clearly against another company that is in Chile that is Vancouver based and is operating uh, or developing a oxide deposit in Chile right now. They are called Marimaca. They trade on the TSX V as, or TSX, I believe as well. They're, they have a preliminary economic assessment or a, called a PEA that gives a discounted cash flow valuation of their project as of September 2020. Their mine plan called for 131 million tons of material, grading at 0.47%. Our tonnage, you can see, is over three times as large as their tonnage, and our grade, while being slightly lower, gives us 240% more copper in the ground than they have. On January 17th, we, they were trading at six times our multiple, 
based on a PEA that was issued at 315 per pound of copper with 757 million pre-tax US dollars. Again, we are trading at $4.50 today and they are trading at six times our multiple. What is the difference? We don't have a PEA. However, within the next week or so, our PEA will be complete and we will be ready to announce the results to the market. So it's a very fortuitous time to be listening to this story and hearing about it for the first time, as many people are with this company. We have been traded for a little bit over one year publicly. We are not well known in the market. The speed at which we have developed our story and have put together the economics for this package and this property is very rapid and it's not a well-known story. I have discussed with brokers uh, who have who follow the mining industry very closely and I've told them the story and they all say, I've never heard of World Copper, but this is a fantastic story. We need to get involved and we are working on that. However, the retail market or investors like yourselves can act much more rapidly and I'm giving you that opportunity right now as well to get involved. Not only does this project have fantastic economics with the resource that exists in place supported by the drilling that has already been done, but immediately to the south of that, that we have that Mancha Amaria target that I mentioned. We expect within the next two weeks to get drill permits that will allow us to drill this Mancha Amaria. The, the thesis here or the idea and concept is that this resource has only been half drilled off, that we have the potential to double this resource by proving that the mineralogy continues from north to south. Remember, I already said that this is the largest copper oxide deposit in Chile right now in exploration and development. We have the potential to double that, make it a seven to 800 million ton deposit, which would be by far the largest copper oxide deposit in Chile, potentially the world as well. And that would only allow us to have better opportunities to prove, improve the economics. Now, two weeks ago, we also closed a transaction on another copper oxide project in Arizona. Uh, so just different jurisdiction, which is also a fantastic jurisdiction called the Zonia project. This project was a brownfield operation that was in operations in the 60s and 70s and therefore has already produced copper, but has not produced any since then. And now we are looking to put it back into production in a relatively short order. 50,000 meters has been drilled on this property. And from that, uh, you can see here on the property, and from that, a preliminary economic assessment was carried out for this project four years ago. Since that PEA was done, no further work on the project has been carried out and momentum was lost. The economics of that PEA were also very attractive, 200 million initial capital, 200 million after tax NPV at $3 copper, and at $4 copper, we're talking 450 million after tax NPV or 150 million after tax first year free cash flow. So payback in a little bit over a year. Not only that, but we have the potential to expand this resource by 50% due to some quirks of the permitting in, uh, in Arizona. They constrain the resource for that PEA. We have the opportunity to unlock that and make it larger without any, spending any money on exploration. We also have a 300 to 500 million ton target to the Northeast, which can make this an Escalona sized copper oxide deposit in Chile in a near-term development story as well, just like Escalonas. So that is the World Copper uh, Company offering. We are currently worth about $70 million. We have two fantastic assets, uh, both backed by 43101 independent studies as with economics, as well as the exploration potential. You compare what we have to any of our peers and we are significantly undervalued. And again, the market is not well aware of this but I think a lot of investors are waking up to how important copper is and how important it is to have fantastic assets like these ready for development. That is the story. I'm open for questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lolan. So there's a few questions here. The first one coming from here and uh, Carolina. Carolina is asking, is it, uh, I'm trying to translate it here from Chinese, is it tough to work as a uh, junior to develop copper projects in Chile, understanding the, the, the bigger national companies locally have a lot of power there? 
Uh, it is not, I would say, no, it's not. Uh, Chile is very conducive to mining development, very supportive. There's a lot of junior mining companies in Chile and not just Canadian junior mining companies, but small family owned Chilean operations. There's so much copper in Chile. 10% of Chile's GDP comes from copper. They have the world's largest mines and they have the world's largest copper companies, uh, two of them, Cadelco and Antofagasta. Despite that, there are hundreds of other smaller mines already in operations and many Canadian companies exploring and developing assets. So it's a very good uh, jurisdiction for mining development. Great, uh, this one coming from Addy here. With the two major projects on hand, do you have enough resources to develop both? Yes, we do. We've got significant market interest from institutional investors to support the development of these projects. We have, we're well-funded at the moment for uh, exploring and uh, developing our uh, agenda. We also have $25 million worth of warrants in the money at 60 cents, which means that for the near future, we anticipate some of those warrants coming in that will provide further liquidity. We are at the stage with this company that we're not necessarily focusing on the next few months and where the cash is gonna come from, or even the next year. We're looking for a strategic investor uh, who will bring credibility and clout and interest to the project. And when that happens, this train will be leaving the station very soon. Uh, so anyone who wants to move before that, I think uh, should take a, take a position. This one coming from John here. Lona, can you please comment on the the transportation, the infrastructure, the roads and water access over there. Yes, uh, so I don't know if my screen is still shared. Is that, is it? Maybe not. Um, so yes, we are in a good infrastructure area. There's road access to the site already. We're only a hundred kilometers away from Santiago. Uh, we're 60 kilometers away from the nearest significant uh, community, which is about 30,000 people. Uh, so, all, so that is not so much of an issue. Also, because, uh, and this is something that people ask a lot with copper deposits, they're moving concentrates, which, con which is the product of that sulfide flotation. And they have to move it to a port, which ships it to usually China or Korea or other places where smelters are. We are producing 100% pure copper cathode in sheets. They're usable in the local market. So transportation is not so much of an issue for us as it is for other typical copper deposits. And that's something as well that the market is starting to wake up on uh, with copper oxide deposits. Okay, here, one last question here for you. Will you welcome any Asian strategic uh, investors or partners to your project? Certainly, we're always looking to do business with anybody globally. Copper is a global market. Uh, it's a strategic resource. Uh, every country in the world uses it. Every, uh, for the most part, every country has some sort of supply. So it's a, it's a, it only makes sense to reach out to many different partners in other jurisdictions uh, to make partnerships. So yeah, we're open to Asian <coughs> investors, uh, European investors, African investors, certainly South American, and of course, North America. As a young story, we're focused right now on North America and Europe, where we have easy access to those types of markets. But certainly, we are in discussions to broaden that horizon as this company uh, matures and develops in the marketplace. Thank you, Leland, to for addressing all the questions here. Thank, Thank you, you Gilbert. Time. Thank you, everyone, as well. I appreciate it.